Welcome to Drinking Bros Sports, brought to you by KillCliffCBD.com. Ah, D'Anthony. It's nice to have sports back again, isn't it? Sports. Sports. Yeah. It's multiple sports. I'm, I'm fucking jonesing for anything right now. So mm-hmm. uh, this weekend was the first weekend that multiple sports were running on different channels. <clears throat> and uh, my D was hard. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, it happened to me, too, because I was watching South Korean baseball. Were you really? They, I, no lie, I was just going to ask you about that. You, so you did flip it on? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I was just going to make a joke about how I got hard because there were all the sex dolls in the stands. But thanks for fucking, I ruined up, it. Thanks for fucking up my joke. I ruined it. I apologize for that. No, it's I apologize fine. No, I, I would, though. I mean, I've been watching. Uh, cornhole. To, I've been watching. I, I watch Cornhole on ESPN. I'm not watching that. But we do have, by the way, just a fucking thing for the fans. We we have we're in development with a product, and it's a guy that already exists. He's a drinking bro, mm-hmm. um, and it's called Brew Bag, right? So it's like a mix between beer pong and cornhole, and we're making drinking bros branded shit that's going to be available pretty soon once we hammer out all the details for you. It's a nice backyard slash tailgate slash beach slash drinking game. Yeah, it's very fun. It's the official drinking game. Of the New York Bar Association. Is it really? Yes. So it's like it's a pretty big thing, and it's gonna be it's gonna be dope. But anyways, no, I would never watch that shit. So I, dude, I found myself watching a little bit of cornhole, uh, which was entertaining for maybe twenty minutes. And, yeah, uh, I, I was all done with that. No, I've been watching highlights from previous seasons. Like there was one I watched this morning, and it was like examples. I can't. Remember, it was on YouTube. I can't remember the title, but it was like examples of of players giving each other props and shit mm-hmm. like that. So. A guy hits a fucking home run, but it gets robbed, and he's like, all right, good job. It seemed to happen to Big Poppy more than anybody else. I yeah. don't know if that means he's got warning track power or what, but it wasn't just that. It was like line drives and the gap were getting stolen from this guy. Sure, sure. But that's what happens when you're fucking a drug cartel uh, guy's wife. Yep, right? and then you give her an $85,000 Lexus that you paid for in cash the morning uh, that you got shot yeah. inside of a bar. But you I'm know, a big fan of David Ortiz, by the way. I am too. Look, and he's a great personality. Yeah. He's just, uh, you can't fuck around with, with drug lords' wives. No. Um, no, but uh, this weekend I watched NASCAR. Mm-hmm. Um, I watched the match with uh, Tiger and Phil. Um, that was fun. And then, you know, we got John Anik on the show today because UFC is back yet again yep. uh, with another powerhouse card, and we're amped about that. So, um, uh, you know, after watching all of it, I would say all weekend long, right? NASCAR seemed to have it dialed in. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You, you have, <clears throat> UFC has had it dialed in. And John Anik will talk about that when he hops on in a second. They've had it dialed in. I think this Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson thing was a great way to, to show, hey, the PGA can come back. And I know they're coming back June 9th, but I felt pretty confident that they can come back pretty easily. I mean, well, let's I mean, face it, you're always 300 yards away from the yeah. Anyway. If there's like, if there's any sport where you can legit social distance, which I think personally, I look, I'm on record. This is all stupid. Yeah, uh, we're not saying that COVID isn't dangerous for the people it's dangerous for. I'm saying that it's not dangerous for 99.7 percent of people. Yes. So leave me the fuck out of it. Yeah. Basically, um, and stop being fat. That helps. Huh? Like obesity, yeah. smoking. Bad for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's stop that, and we can get back to our regular lives. Anyways, uh, no, I, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> uh, we care about you. We're picking all of the winners uh, this Saturday night um, in the UFC with John Anik here in a second. But as always, we get some sponsors who put this uh, whole shit wagon on the air. First and foremost is our title sponsor for for the sports show. For the entire year, KillCliffCBD.com. Uh, I love it when uh, I would say a drink that I would have bought anyways, like a million mm-hmm. times over. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this. I'd buy this. I'd buy their drinks anyway. I do buy it. Sponsoring the fucking show. Oh, yeah. So do I. But I use my own promo code. <clears throat> um, it's nice to have a promo code. I will yeah. say that. But I would buy this shit anyways. It's just a. Mm-hmm. It's a dream that you, you have something like this where it's like, hey, we drink this shit every day, and they're like, hey, we'd love to sponsor the show. Awesome. Go to KillCubCBD.com today. Use the promo code Drinking Bros for 20% off uh, and free shipping, which is key, especially when you're shipping cans um, because that can get pricey. Uh, three amazing flavors, grape, mango, and orange kush. Uh, the grape is obviously my favorite, and uh, there's 25 milligrams of CBD in every single 
can, you will not piss hot for THC. There is no THC in any of these cans. So you won't piss hot during a drug test. So if you're out there, uh, you know, first responder wise, and you got to take a drug test, mm -hmm. you're not going to piss hot on this. Kill Cliff is the only name you can trust in this space. Go to KillCliffCBD.com today. Promo code Drinking Bros, twenty percent off and free shipping. Next up, we got GhostBed.com forward slash Drinking Bros. D'Anthony, thirty-six month page you go program. No interest mm -hmm. is still around. So is their fucking Memorial Day. Sale. Yeah. Dude. If, there, if there's any company on earth that has done gone out of its way to be good to veterans and first responders and then during this pandemic horse shit to do what they can for anybody that uses their products, mm -hmm. this is the one. Yeah. For sure. They've gone they've they've really bent over backwards to make sure people are still look, it's a third of your life. Yeah. That you spend in bed, give yeah, or take. Yeah. Um, what's that old union saying? Uh, eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, and eight hours for what you will is supposed to be the, the magic formula there. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to spend a third of your life sleeping, you may as well do it on something that's quality. I think they understand how big of a purchase it is. That's why they give all these great deals all the time. Yeah, man. I mean, right now they're offering 30% off in a bundle package for Memorial Day. That'll go all the way through June 5th. So that's everything they have on the website. You can bumble, bundle it together, get 30% off, and use that with the 36-month page you go program. No interest. Go to ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros today and, and get yourself a mattress, man. They got uh, the best sheets in the biz, too. Um, and then the, the fucking cooling mattress and the adjustable base. Uh, Mom, I'm sorry. I'm going to get you one soon. I, uh, I keep I keep beefing that up. As I'm a bad shot. I'm going to get you that adjustable base uh, next week, Mom. I love you. Uh, last but not least, D'Anthony, um, after ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros comes dukecannon.com. Here we go. Uh, best body wash in the biz, dude. Thick. Thick. The old glory is my jam. The naval supremacy is your jam. Mm -hmm. um, this was one that you guys picked out for us, actually. And you said, hey, we love Duke Cannon. We use it every day. Can we get a fucking promo code? And I was like, yeah, man, we'll reach out to them. They were nice enough to uh, to come on the show as a sponsor. Uh, I, I don't know that they need it, to be honest with you. I don't know that they need it. They're doing really well, but, I mean, look, they want to connect. It's a veteran-owned company, so they want to connect with this audience. I get it, man. I would have done the same thing. It's a, it's it's also – it happens to be a, a really good product. It's not one of mm -hmm. those – there's a lot of gimmicky veteran-owned companies out there, you know what I mean, uh, that – provide substandard quality products, frankly, if I'm being honest. But that's the case with most companies. That's why most companies fail. Yeah. Duke Cannon is not one of those companies. They are doing very well for themselves, and it's not necessarily because of their marketing, although I do like the marketing they do. It's mostly because the product is fucking great and inexpensive. Yes, and, and everybody has asked us to have them on the show. Here's the deal with these, man. Um, it's, it's nine bucks for one of these jugs, and I call it a jug because it's fucking huge. Um, you, you buy one of these, yeah. you're, you're good to go for, for a couple months. Um, fuck, man. I mean, they're, they're massive. And you only need about a quarter size on there. The viscosity yeah. of these goddamn things. Like, you can really fucking loofah up with this. Um, go to DukeCannon.com. Use the promo code DRINKINGBROS for, I believe it's 15 or 20% off there. And you get free shipping. Uh, you get free shipping there, which is amazing. So each one is 9 bucks, or you can get four for 30 because there's four cents there. Might as well get the four pack for thirty and call it a life. Yeah, um, it'd why not? Probably be good for the year, to be honest with you. Go to DukeCannon.com. It spells exactly like it sounds. D U C K. No, that's Duck Ross. Uh, D U K E. Yeah. C A N N O N. Dot com. Promo code Drinking Bros. We'll get you twenty percent off and free shipping there. Highly recommend that four pack. Let's get into the show with Mister John Anik, shall we? Best in the biz. Uh, in my opinion, announcing wise, he's, he's the nice. best. Yeah. Welcome to Drinking Bros Sports Companion Show. Look, when we we talk about UFC, there's only one guy that we can bring on the show who, in my opinion, knows more than than anyone else doing it in the business today, yeah. and, and that's Mr. John Anik. John, thanks for joining us, buddy. Oh, my pleasure. Pleasure's all on this side of the table, boys. You know, I always take that call. <laughs> Your voice. You always talk about how great my voice is. Your voice is just absolute butter. And I didn't know how much oh. I missed it until you weren't on that card the other night. And Dan and I were watching it. And we were like, 
wait a minute. I don't hear Anik on this. Something feels off. It, it feels unfamiliar to me. And uh, sure enough, we, we were right. And you weren't on there. And I was like, who's the guy with the red hair and the beard? Where's Anik? <laughs> Well, that's well, I appreciate summer. that. I mean, there's no greater compliment because, as I've said to you guys in the past, we get so sick of the sound of our own voices. So for other people that if they want to watch the UFC mm-hmm. and want to watch the title fights, they have no choice but to listen to my voice. So thankfully, uh, it's not killing your ears this morning. You know, another, no. th- another thing that I like that you guys have been doing recently, by the way, and I think it's part of I think it's supplemental to make up for the fact that there's no crowd is that we've been seeing. Uh, the commentators' reactions mm-hmm. during during the post fight stuff, when it's going like if somebody gets knocked out, they show like the fucking the single camera on your face reacting right. to stuff. Yeah. I really like that. I liked when uh, during spring training, Major League Baseball started miking up all the players and shit. That that became a part of the game that I really enjoyed because the inside part of stuff, like people who know the right. most about it, are going to be able to animate things to you that you just don't understand. It's like it's it's like real-time, full-time, behind-the-scenes footage. And you guys are killing it over there, to be honest, with this whole thing. Well, I appreciate it. I mean, certainly it was a different watch for people, right, without a crowd, without any filter for the corner audios and things like that. So I think the broadcast maybe took on a little bit of a different tone. Um, But, no, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, I I would always prefer to not – have the camera in my face right like i think in a perfect world when we go into the locker rooms with behind the scenes content it wouldn't be me saying coming up next you would hear what the hell those guys were talking about live because i think you'd get some pretty interesting content there but when we go to the ufc apex now in vegas we may not be on the floor so it might be a totally different animal in terms of the broadcast booth and and where it is in relation to uh to the octagon yeah and look to me personally um i think it separates the men from the boys as far as announcers go in this world um, I've seen a lot of people having problems calling different sports without fans in them where there's either a lot of dead air or they're waiting for a crowd to react to something you personally have not had that problem however I, I you've kind of seen it in NASCAR and I saw it at the the golf tournament over the weekend they brought in Charles Barkley and they try to do yeah. some fun stuff with it but there was so many gaps in time where it's just dead air and you don't realize how valuable and important an announcer is to their sport until you're faced with a challenge like this. Um, You've been phenomenal at it and uh, you've been able to carry on. Why is that and how have you been able to to block out waiting for a crowd and all that other stuff versus some of the others who, who have not been able to do that so well? Well, again, you know, I appreciate it. It's funny because in terms of the dead air, it's something we try to embrace when we're broadcasting in a normal situation, Mm -hmm. right? To let that ambient sound come in, to let the gnats come in, to hear the crowd, to let the fighters walk, bleed a little bit, right? And so now, obviously, we're not letting that happen. But the noise-canceling headphones are a very powerful thing. I'm so in the moment and focused on calling the fight that I'm really not thinking about anything else. So it really didn't change my workflow very much on fight night, except that the athletes were hearing us. And I was more measured on Wednesday night than I was on the previous Saturday, at least in terms of relaying corner audio and things like that, that I thought maybe the other corner or fighter could pick up on potentially uh but for me it's it's a tunnel man and i'm just fucking screaming and veins are popping out of my neck and uh i'd have it no other way it's a little weird when the athletes can hear it especially when they're on the wrong end of a seminal shot if they get kicked in the head you hear the announcers go crazy not ideal you know so right. i don't know if that dynamic's going to be in place in vegas but we've certainly uh ha- had to make a few pivots here and there yeah, it's, I, look, in my opinion, you've just absolutely knocked it out of the park. And uh, that was one of the things that I was curious about is if the fighters could hear you guys, were they reacting to, to some of the things that you were saying of like, oh, man, that guy's slipping a left. Like, w- w- were they going back to the corner saying, hey, man, I could hear Anik or I could hear DC. And, you know, I've got to we've got to readjust because I know in one of the fights um, you would mention something that it had gotten in another fighter's head where he could hear his coaches too much. And he was trying to do everything that his coach was saying, and he gassed himself right. out. Um, yeah, but there's a there's an opposite example of that, and it's uh, Justin Gagey, because he did everything his coaches. And I think the guys, uh, I think you guys were commenting on it at the time as it was in progress, but it was like, this guy is someone that's a very talented fighter, but 
he gets a little loose in fights sometimes and loses focus and being able like it seemed like in real time he was responding to exactly what his coach was saying and you look you've watched enough fights to know that that's not the case most of the time most of the time right. the fighter in their head are like dude just shut the fuck up i'm trying to fight here you know uh -huh. what i mean yeah, well, and a lot of that gets filtered out by the crowd. So you may hear bits and pieces of what your coach is saying. And certain coaches have codes that they're mm -hmm. trying to relay that are specific to striking combinations. But, yeah, this was a totally different feel for the fighters. And I think Justin Gaethje is a guy who sort of maximized it. There were other fighters, Carla Esparza and mm -hmm. Greg Hardy, suggesting that they heard Daniel Cormier's analysis and actually tried to incorporate that yeah, strategically, yeah, yeah. which is crazy. The best moment for me, though, was Ricky Simone, a bantamweight, we start talking about his physique, right? And he can hear every goddamn word, so he just starts <laughs> fucking flexing, you know? I mean, it, it, it effectively changed the sport at, yeah. at, in that moment for me. It's like this dude is in a cage fight, fighting for his life essentially, right? Um, and he's hearing us talk about him in a positive way about his cardio and mm -hmm. his physique, and he starts flexing in the moment. It's just, Obviously, that doesn't happen even if you're fighting the first fight of the night right. anywhere around the world <laughs> in a different climate with fans. So well, uh, it's crazy, but not ideal for me. In a perfect world, I don't want the athletes hearing anything I say during the fight. Right, yeah. But I it mean, has it, – it, look, as, as fans, it has been enjoyable, man. It, yeah. it is one of those sports that translates without fans um, because yeah. – you're able, I, you know, Dan and I, we watch, you know, all, all three cards so far um, with each other. So we, mm -hmm. could, we could chat about it on air. And we each said the same thing of like, man, you can hear every punch. You can hear every last yeah. kick, slap. I mean, every single thing that you could never hear before. <laughs> and with your description along with it, I, I didn't miss the crowd all that much. There was maybe that, that gagey fight where I was just like, all right, yes, a crowd would have gone ballistic that, uh, you know. Ferguson got his head beat in over and over and over again. But the way you guys called it was just as entertaining as what we were seeing and hearing. So I was okay with it. It has definitely been a sport that's translated. Well, and I think a lot of people were great with it. I think in terms of like us going to take a piss during the broadcast, it was outstanding. I mean, are you kidding me? <laughs> Literally having to navigate that. I go to a public restroom one time in seven hours and – you know, I just got the whole goddamn joint to myself. So, yes, from that <laughs> standpoint and certain other standpoints, it, it was great. Um, but what's interesting, when you talk about hearing every strike, I think that's what elicits the reactions from us so demonstratively yeah. on a podcast. And now you guys are all hearing that. Because when we're sitting on the base of the octagon, even though I'm watching the monitor 87.5% of the time in theory – now you guys are all hearing that natural sound and living with every strike like we are. So it's cool to hear from fans. I think a lot of fans actually enjoy it. And, you know, there are obviously certain crowds we have that start wooing and they're not knowledgeable. So anytime they grapple or wrestle, wrestle they start booing. Uh, so there are advantages, but uh, I want that live crowd back, as I know most people do. Yeah. When, when do you think that's going to be exactly? Has Dana given any indication because um, I know some of the the presidents of universities for college football, for example, of saying, hey, we're going to have fans back in the stands. The owner of the Miami Dolphins came out today and said, we fully anticipate having fans in the stands in September. Uh, has Dana said, hey, man, we've got a, a, a date that we're eyeing to bring some fans back? No, that's one thing that he doesn't seem uh, in any great rush to do. I wouldn't be surprised. And this is not even informed speculation, but if there were no fans for the rest of 2020, which is just insane for us to think about not having a single live gate the rest of the year. But that is our reality. And you could do checkered seating and all different things. You could try to have rapid testing somehow so people were not just screened, but maybe more thoroughly screened with an <laughs> antibody test if you're really trying to get two or 3,000 people in the building instead of 15 or 20. Uh, I'd imagine they've thought of everything. I mean, aren't you guys glad? Well, I know for you guys, and I was going to – I'm very curious about your future and when you guys are hitting the road again, but I'm just so glad that these decisions aren't on my desk in terms of having to navigate these waters because for Dan and the executives, uh, every day uh, there's a new obstacle to overcome, mm -hmm. and, and fans are, I think, the least of their concerns, at least right now. Yeah, I mean, look, I would love to have that responsibility on my desk because – I know you would, Dan. It would, all, <laughs> it would all be super easy. If you are sick currently, think you might be sick. If you have a respiratory illness or any of the other myriad of things, including obesity or old age, that is going to make you 
one of the 0.3 to 0.5% of people that can actually die from this, stay the fuck home. Otherwise, do what right. you want. I mean, right. it's pretty goddamn simple. We, we've uh -huh. been doing this as a species for about 15,000 years now, right? You think maybe right. we had learned this is the first time in human history that we've quarantined all the healthy people along with the sick people. Fuck this shit. I don't even care. Right. Well, and I think there's a lot of truth in there. And look what we just accomplished. And I shouldn't say we, right? But look what the UFC just accomplished in Jacksonville. Over 1,100 COVID-19 tests, right? Mm -hmm. Zero people were symptomatic and three people asymptomatically tested positive mm -hmm. in over 1,100 tests. And you guys know you, you come and you take over a hotel. The kitchen was nonstop in terms of the room service and mm -hmm. everything else. And uh everybody seemed to emerge unscathed. So I think it's certainly a good sort of harbinger of things to come. I mean, I hate to get ahead of ourselves and we do have, you know, a lot of athletes obviously coming into Las Vegas week after week after week. And I'm ho hoping we can have a similar fate, but I mean, that was certainly pretty encouraging, Dan. Don't you think that the UFC <laughs> was able to get three shows in the can in eight days? Uh, yeah, and dude. didn't really like from, suffer at all. From every perspective, it was good from the way you guys handled not having a crowd to the, what I know had to be a lot more advanced production of short clips and then uh, previews and new shows to fill dead air and all that stuff. The whole thing came off essentially without a hitch. I mean, there were some weird parts where guys were running out, they're listening to their, their uh, warm up music or whatever the fuck. And they, you know, they yeah. get that feeling to start interacting with the crowd and you can see it in their eyes. They realize there's no crowd there all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they're like, oh, shit. So it was a little awkward sometimes, but at least we didn't put fucking sex dolls in the stands like South Korean baseball did. All right. Yeah. Right. Although I'm I'm a good with people, that, too. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> I mean, have funny. talked about yeah. us putting some white noise or some. I will tell you guys, when I voice a video game. I do have some sort of white noise mm -hmm. crowd muffled in my headset, and it certainly aids us in that process. But I'm kind of glad that it is the way it is, and they're not piping in artificial sound. Uh, you hear every thwack. I mean, there yeah. is no mm -hmm. doubt. Yeah, I, and, and God bless Dana White. Um, he did it. He did everything he said he was going to do, and he put on yeah. the most exciting cards. Man, out of the three that you've done so far, my God, man, uh, could you have <laughs> any better matches in those? Like, across the yeah. board, those were lights out. I, I, I've enjoyed all of great. them. Great. The fights were great. And the Saturday show that I didn't do on the 16th of the month, I think it was, was unbelievable sitting yeah. home, you know? Uh, so it's been great. Obviously, the fighters... Uh, the other thing, too, is there is this narrative that a lot of people have leaned into that the fighters would not be elite or optimized or, you know, in their total mixed martial arts realm. And to a man, to a woman on this roster, that yeah, there have been some limitations, but it's been more benefit than detriment in terms of these guys getting prepared for these fights, whether they have a smaller isolation circle or they're getting more intensive one-on-one -on -one coaching. Most fighters, I think, as crazy as it may sound, would trade this new alternative for the crowded gyms that maybe they used to occupy. So, Yeah, um, and those three people that you, you brought up who tested positive, I want to point out, because Dana White pointed out this as well, it was a fighter and then two of his trainers, correct? Same guy, same yes. team? And, yeah. and I'll tell you, you know, I went back for my second nasal swab and I was about eight feet away from these guys and, uh, you know, asymptomatic. And uh, I don't know how caught off guard they were because I think Jacare Souza maybe had a relative that uh, had tested positive or they thought might be symptomatic. Um, but yeah, the UFC handled it beautifully. And the thing is too about Dana, he's worthy of all the praise. And so is every executive that he's aligned himself with, but he spent 20 years essentially refining and building this well-oiled machine. And some people, when I go down this road, people just think I'm a fucking shill, but hear me out for a second in terms of safety and security and everything he's done and building this over 20 years, he's not surprised he was able to get three shows done in eight days, even though this is a climate that nobody's experienced before. He's been building to try to get events off with a bunch of limitations and obstacles his whole career. So uh, I don't think Dana was surprised, but I think he's happy we got three in the can. Yeah, well, let's talk about these three in the can. So yeah. the first fight, UFC 249, holy shit. That, yeah. That's one of the better, it's one of the more well-rounded lineups that I think I've ever seen. It Across might be, the board. It might be the best. I mean, Gaethje Ferguson, Cahuto, Cruz... Ganu uh, and Ganu and the guy that he murdered. Uh, <laughs> R.I.P. R.I.P. Uh, to him, you know. Uh, Pettis, <laughs> Pettis and Cerrone. I mean, that's uh, and that was the pre prelim, the last prelim. 
which is kind of interesting. Right. A lot of people were bitching that that was the last prelim instead of Greg Hardy being a prelim. Yeah. I get it. Those yeah. two guys. I kind yeah. of expected a knockout out of that Pettis Cerrone fight, to be honest. Because of the way those two guys fight, they're both wild assholes. And uh, right. Pettis wants to run up the side of the cage like Bo Jackson and kick somebody in the face. I got it, man. <laughs> I feel that energy, but uh, <laughs> it was still a good fight. Uh, gambling wise, I want to point this out too on that card. Um, I don't know if you remember this. We'll give you a little refresher. Daddy was oh. Daddy was seven and one. Rostradamus was seven and one. Wow. When you were on the show, Dan actually went eight and zero. Oh. Mm. The only fight I missed was that girl fight, and I still think uh, Hadi Karate won. Um, right. I want to, and I said, look, next time Annette comes on, I'm gonna get a fucking answer from him on this because I think she won that fight. I should have been an eight and zero, oh and not and vice versa. Who do All you? Right, so on that fight, you're talking about Carla Esparza versus Michelle Waters, correct? Yep. And. <clears throat> I watching the fight live, I was surprised that Michelle was so put off by being on the wrong end of a split decision. You know, watching it as a commentator, I've told you guys before you can throw out my scorecard, but uh, I hate to tell you, Ross, watching it live, I kind of thought Carla Sparza won two of those. Oh, that's rounds. exactly what Dan um, said you would but say. Most too. People, <laughs> but most of the sharp handicapping types don't mm -hmm. necessarily agree with me. You know, I thought the most. Egregious scorecard was 30 to 27 Waterson. There was no way she won three rounds. But how about Dano going fucking eight? No. How about Francis and Ganu, though, guys? Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, does, anybody right now? does anybody want to fight him? Does anybody want to fight him? Does anybody want to fight that guy? Because I wouldn't fight him. I would shoot that guy right in his face and then run away. Well, Still, it's, I'd it's run away from the corpse. Asking, it's, <laughs> it's one thing if you're asking, does anybody want to fight him or is there anybody willing to fight him or intimidated to fight him? There's certainly guys who are not intimidated to fight him. There are a lot of. Uh, monsters out there but no nobody would want to fight that guy right now i wouldn't think stipe or daniel cormier or anybody else would, would want to fight him yeah um, no, no that, matter how large the bag i mean i love cormier just like every i don't think anybody dislikes that guy to be honest but uh i would not want to see that fight to me that fight would be like uh adesanya versus uh what's his nuts um anderson silva, anderson silva, silva yeah yeah because it's so, like cormier is 41 now right Yes. So, right. And that's a big part of it because yeah. going into the DPA rematch for DC couldn't really wrestle because of his back. So right. where is DC at 41? But stylistically, Dan, if there's anybody yeah. uh, who has the recipe in theory to ground Francis and keep him there, yeah. it would be Daniel. But again, people reference the first fight with Stipe and Francis Ngannou and think that all of a sudden, a couple of years later, it's just going to go the same way. I mean, <laughs> I think Francis' cardio is better. His get-ups are better. Mm -hmm. uh, I know he seems like an un caged animal in there and mm. a little bit wild on the feet and you can certainly pick him apart technically but good luck getting through the first fucking minute best of luck yeah that dude's swinging know? fucking lunchbox fists at your face so I, I mean there's only there's only so much of that you can block you still you're still absorbing quite a bit of energy you know what I mean? Yeah. I would yeah, love to hear yeah, uh, John Briggs do a sports science on Francis Ngannou Oof. just to see what the fucking oh, foot yeah. pound pressure behind that punch is because Jesus Christ I I don't. It, it I really wouldn't, is. It, it's unique. I wouldn't and want again, to see God, that. We've talked about all these light heavyweights and all these heavyweights over mm. the years, and this guy is unique in terms of the power. Anthony Rumble Johnson's really the only mm. point of comparison for me. Maybe Shane Carwin. Um, God, but, Shane Carwin. That's a throwback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, people throw his name out a lot when I start to get on the uh, Ingano hype train in terms of the power. But, you know, most people thought that was going to be a super quick fight one way or the other. Mm. And, uh, again, <laughs> Francis has taken out four of the best heavyweights in the world all in 111 or less since he fought for the belt. Yeah. Uh, he, he should be on billboards in Los Angeles within two years, I would think. Yeah, I, I agree. Sure. And I think, to me, it's probably Stipe Cormier one more time. Uh, yep. w whatever the outcome is going to be, Cormier retires after that. I don't think Stipe wants to fight Ngannou um, uh, again. I don't think anybody wants to fight that guy. I don't either, but I, I think I think then that it kind of leaves you with John Jones left on that. So you know, I, John Jones has said, "Hey, I'll fight him. I'm good." I would love to see that fucking fight. So, th like, I think that might be the only person. To be honest, if they, I, I think if I think if uh, if they fought. John Jones would probably catch him up high with a kick or something like that. He's just so technically skilled and patient. I feel like Ngannou's aggressiveness would work against him. But, hey, who knows? He's been progressing as a fighter over the last three years way more technically than I thought he would do because somebody with that that's not naturally physically gifted usually just decides to use those physical gifts. 
Um, and I think John Jones has been regressing. I don't. He doesn't look as sharp to me as he, he looks has bored. in the past. He looks bored. He looks like the fucking the last six, two or three fights have been boring to he, me. He John look, Jones. Fights. Yeah, he looks like the sixteen seventeen Warriors at yeah. this point. Yeah. It's like, eh, where to beat everybody? What else have we got to do? Yeah. Yeah. Win seventy three games well, and they go into the playoffs. They're like, ah, oh, this is stupid. No, I mean, the, the numbers recently back up everything that you're saying. You know, he's got 10 decision wins now. So for one reason or another, he's not putting guys away like he used to. Mm. Uh, maybe the fighters and the challenges are getting better and, and they're figuring out a way to survive, if not advance against John Jones. But the Nganu matchup is fascinating. I did interview Dana White last Friday and he seems lukewarm on the fight. And I think in part because competitively, you got to think, so Ngannou's next fight will probably be for the heavyweight title, and John Jones will be defending his light heavyweight title. So if those two fight, what exactly are we are we competing for, and what's the ramification for the loser? You know, Kenny Florian mm. brought this up on our podcast this week. Are you gonna have those guys fight in like a BMF belt situation? Yeah. Or, yeah. So there are divisional ramifications that might get in the way of that, but there's no doubt the fan appetite is pretty fucking. Strong well, obviously, Ngannou is not going to fucking lose weight down to light heavy. That's not even no. possible. No, it's a heavyweight fight, and he's yeah. not even Dan going to cut down to a catch weight of two fifty five. No. Francis yeah. cuts yeah. a few pounds now to two sixty five, two sixty six yeah. is the limit. Uh, so well, he yeah, came in not, at what two sixty three for the last one. Yeah, he's not cutting that much weight. Yeah. He never, he never and has. John, that. Everybody has said John is eventually going to move up to the heavyweight division. I just would like to see when he does it to have him do it with six months of weight training, try to be yeah. 240 pounds of, of muscle uh, and really try to make a run at the heavyweight title instead of just a one-off against uh, right. Ngannou. But we'll see. I mean, he's walking around at, what, 225, 220, 225 probably if he's cutting down. Yeah, I think so. Maybe pushing 230. I mean, he he on Instagram, I you know, I think is saying that he's carrying some extra fat right now. And he gets into deadlifting and big heavy lifting at times in the past. So we'll see how he proceeds. But again, there's a lot of there's a lot of light heavyweight title options for him right now. The Reyes rematch, Jan Bohovic, Um, there are contenders, so we just gotta see. Yeah. Uh the other fight that night that was historic is Cahuto and Cruz. I mean, that's a passing of the belt kind of situation. I like I like seeing that. I enjoyed that. I don't want to see uh, Cormier and Ganu passing of the belt because that's gonna. I think that would be kind of brutal, to be honest. I did too. I mean, just so just Hudo, with, though. Do you think he stays retired? Uh no, there's no way. I think he's he's looking for money. I guess it depends on the money, right? And I don't. I well, don't. So the tricky. It's a sorry, Dan. It's a no, tricky right. thing because of the belt, right? Because he has now vacated the belt. So if you go to yeah. UFC.com, there is no bantamweight champion. There is no flyweight champion. Yeah. So a lot of of earning potential and show money is based upon being the champion. So this is a clear vacating of the title, a clear step away. Could he come back in 2021, perhaps? Uh, but knowing Henry the way I do, this feels. This feels kind of final. I don't know. Do you think? Because I've heard some speculation about him boxing. Do you? Th I mean, is there any name big enough in his weight class in WBA or any of those other boxing organizations that would make a super matchup like that? I mean, or would it be some kind of catch? I guess it doesn't really He's matter. He's got to come up to one forty-five. Well, he I probably think. walks around at like one fifty, one sixty. So he's that wouldn't be too big of a stretch for him, and it would probably be better for boxing because you got to be more agile on the ground. But you want to have. Yeah, some weight, weight on you, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I mean, who, but who would he fight? Uh, there's a bunch of welterweights, so you know, you could come, you could fight Manny Pacquiao if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, 147 <laughs> pounds would be the weight class. He's sick yeah. of cutting weight anyway, so yeah. I don't think you know. I think that would be okay. Uh, I just think that uh, I would bet on Henry Cejudo if I could in terms of whatever uh, he would choose to do. Crazy that he conquered MMA the way he did when you think about a guy who literally almost walked away from some tough weight cuts early on in his MMA mm -hmm. career, and then the dude goes out and wins two belts in different UFC divisions, defends them both. It's, it's, it is absolutely crazy, and what a G move if this is the way he walks away to go out like that. I mean, what a fucking boss just yeah. saying, yeah. you know what? If I'm not making a million to show, I'm the best in the world entering my fighting prime. I'm going to go sell real estate. Yeah. You know, it's Why crazy. Um, so the next fight was uh, was headlined by Anthony Smith and Glover Teixeira. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that next card. An uh. Anthony Smith. I, I honestly think if UFC didn't exist, if professional fighting didn't exist, he would find a way to fight somebody. I just feel, he just seems to really – and he's not – I've been on other shows with him and stuff. He's, he's the nicest guy of all time, but he just yep. there's something inside of him that wants to physically harm other people 
all the time. Like he just loves the competition. You can hear it when, especially now that there's no crowd, when he's in the corner, he's not like, he's not upset when he's saying this dude's knocking my fucking teeth out. He's like, Hey, this guy's knocking my fucking teeth out. It's yeah. like a, bat, it's like a batter getting struck out and tipping their cap to somebody. You know what I mean? He seems to like really enjoy fighting, which is, I mean, that's pretty crazy to be honest. And that was a gnarly yeah, fight man. as well. Yeah, it was. And you sort of set him up as an individual pretty well. I mean, he is so unassuming and yeah. so nice. He's so much nicer than like Dan, for example, right? In terms oh, of yeah. His I'm a and, terrible person, right? yeah. But it is amazing. And for me, it's been sort of nice to watch him evolve as one of our UFC mm -hmm. analysts. Because, again, this is a guy who's got 13 or 14 career losses. You know, a yeah. guy who was left dead uh, back in 2013. He had lost three in a row got cut from the UFC and then lost again after getting cut from the UFC. So the fact that this guy now has a TV career mm -hmm. as an MMA analyst is, <laughs> is absolutely amazing. But yeah, it was a tough fight. He was on the wrong end of it. And, uh, I know there's a lot of different angles to that stoppage, the referee, the corner, but the story really should be Glover Teixeira at 40 years old yeah. <laughs> being in the best shape of his life. And all of a sudden looking like a guy who, is a thoroughbred of a challenger for John Jones at yeah. 40 years old. It's I mean, crazy to that, me. That level of energy, very... I did not Dude. expect from a guy that's 40 years old. I don't even have that. Well, I guess I'll be 40 next year, but I, I don't have that amount of energy to like go for. And he Pe didn't have that. Anybody that doesn't, that's never wrestled in their life, like in high school or whatever the fuck, and that's the best way, in my opinion, to, to gauge endurance is that process. If you never wrestled before, you just don't understand how fucking physically grueling being locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat for 15 straight minutes with a couple of minute and a half breaks in between them can be yeah. like, it's fucking terrible. And by the end of it, it's not just physical exhaustion, but your brain is like fucking stop this stuff. This is not worth it. Why are we doing this? And to You're, do it at 40 years old um, and to do it at that level against a competitor like Anthony Smith, because you know, Anthony Smith one is showing up prepared and two, he's going to have, he's going to match your energy in some way or, or another. Like even if it, if it's not literal energy, it's intensity or some kind of shit because he's it's a warrior. Yeah, Craig, he was a plus one sixty underdog, and uh, he's whole wholly revamped in terms of the strength and conditioning, and got rid of the negative emotions that were sort of accompanying his training and. Mm thought about maybe retiring and now all of a sudden he's won four in a row but that was the thing about that fight for me glover wasn't going anywhere if he had to fight 45 50 minutes at 40 years old i would never seen anything like it you know so all of a sudden we thought about oh, it's a nice fight you know nice opportunity for glover and i left leaving that arena thinking dude this guy could actually get another title fight it's crazy yeah it's nuts uh i'm gonna i'm gonna throw uh the plus 160 at you real quick um a lot of announcers and ESPN and everywhere else, everybody's switching over to sports gambling. Um, yeah. Are, are they telling you guys to do that? And this is part of a longer conversation I'd love to have with you. Are they telling you guys to now do that? Because that was not a thing back in the day. That wasn't a thing no. probably six, eight months ago. Right. So as you guys know, it's always been a thing for me. I was placing $10 three-team baseball parlays mm -hmm. in my college dorm room as a freshman when it was elite. Well, it's no more legal now, I guess. But I was doing it on websites that I probably shouldn't have back in the day. I've always had an appetite for this stuff. I love seeing sports broadcasting and the league sort of embrace this. So when I was at Fox or when the UFC was at Fox, at one point, George Greenberg, the chief Fox executive for MMA, said, hey, I want you to give a verbal mention for the odds for every main card bout and uh, ah. music to my ears. Obviously, I was like, I can do that for you, sir. But no, there's, <laughs> there's no directive. But for me... It's, it's just another lens through which to look at these sporting events and to not say, hey, Vegas thinks Anthony Smith is a two-to-one favorite right now. To leave that out to me feels like we're painting an incomplete picture. You've seen yeah. Rogan embrace it. He's <clears throat> fascinated by it. And I think anybody should be respective of, of the Vegas take and respecting the odds makers and those sharp minds out there. And again, it's something that really, I think, enhances the broadcast. And for leagues mm. that aren't doing it, um, obviously, they're – they're behind the eight ball now. Yeah. yeah, and you know one of our biggest sponsors, obviously on our sports show, is MyBookie.com. Promo code Drinking Bros doubles your deposit if you're out there and haven't gambled yet. Um, but the fascinating part about why I bring this up is uh, we had a bunch of people over the fight. It was way more than ten. Sorry out there for everybody who cares about the fucking social distancing. Um, every single person <laughs> that was at my house for that first card had money on the fight, and that was the the, the first time that I had seen everybody using some form of gambling app uh, to bet on the fight, 
One, because it's been so long since we've been able to gamble on anything uh, sports-related. But two, ESPN, Fox, and everybody, all their running scrolls at the you know the lower third to the bottom of the screen now is just odds, 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 yeah. odds, mm-hmm. odds. Um, even ESPN has embraced it, where they have a you know the, the daily wager on ESPN two, where it's just a right. betting show every single day for all sports, anything sports related, um, and that to me was super interesting because as a <clears> fan <throat> at home, I'm with ten people, you know, few of them are strangers, some have gotten friends of friends. We're all screaming at the television for different reasons, and you know, right. that, it might have been part of why I also didn't miss the crowd where I, we were screaming our own goddamn living room over it. Um, all right. Yeah, that's a weird consequence of all this stuff. I wonder if more people are going to gather together to watch minor sporting events than they did before because since the crowd's not there, you feel like you're watching. You like you feel the the aloneness of watching a a baseball stadium with nobody in it, for example. Yeah. Like I yeah. think I think to make that seem and feel normal, you need somebody else in the room with you maybe. And you need to have yeah. money on it. Like to have money on it makes it even more exciting. And if you're, you know, kind of stuck inside a little bit here and there, <clears throat> um if if these crowds are not allowed back in any stadiums, it certainly amplifies it for me and everybody else that was there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. No, I think you guys hit on a lot of good stuff. I mean, certainly when you're betting on another sporting event that isn't combat that isn't fighting if you're not an avid gambler who's doing in-game wagering and all this live stuff props and everything else you got to wait till the end of the game might be three hours right with these fights you can constantly be betting you get 13 opportunities Mm -hmm. over the course of the night uh and that's just if you're betting a side never mind the over under and the rounds and everything else and i think it's a good way if you're just getting into this sport because it is maybe the only option out there for you it's a good way to get invested and make you want to watch it because, mm-hmm. you know, maybe the scorecards don't go your way. If you have action, you're actually watching it with a more invested eye. And then maybe you have a greater appreciation for the sport. But man, I mean, I'm hearing from people across the U S who never bet on sports, who are making deposits like my younger brother for yeah. the first time, just fucking bet on this shit. Uh, and I do think in terms of like the watch parties for minor sporting events, like this Saturday night, Tyron Woodley is fighting Gilbert Burns. There is no UFC welterweight championship on the line. I'm not calling the fight and I'm sitting here fucking counting down the hours and the days to watch that main event on Saturday night. I'm not saying it's a minor event, but I wish I was having watch parties with you boys for it. That's for sure. I know. And look, we're we're because we're betting on all this stuff. I bet on the fucking Tiger Woods, the the match. Um, you know, Tiger and uh, Peyton Manning versus Tom yeah. Brady and uh, and Phil Mickelson. I even bet on that because there was nothing going on. It was just like, eh, let's throw a hundo My on it, see what happens. My bookie had minus two sixty or minus two eighty on Tiger Woods to wear red i mean you just empty the whole account on that proposition yeah. whatever the match <laughs> wager is if it's a sunday then he's wearing red yeah and it's, yeah. this oh yeah i mean this this qualified right it I was mean, the easiest so. call of all time so it was uh minus 180 for tiger woods in that match um i did take tiger in it, and so you know I, and i got the the w i was surprised at how shitty tom brady was as a golfer uh-huh. <laughs> did you watch any I mean, of it tiger Tiger wasn't fucking around, huh? Hitting no. every goddamn fairway right out of the shoot. He was ready to go home course. Yeah, he he's he looks thinner to me, by the way. Like I'm not no saying no I'm not saying he was ever on the juice uh, or on some HGH or something, but he definitely looked like he was shrunk down. Maybe it's the quarantine. You and don't he have hasn't been you don't to have to take out. HGH these days. You can take something called Samoralin. What's that? It produces natural. To, uh, HGH, just oh, really? like just like HCG produces natural testosterone. Okay, so there's ways to cheat that system, is all I'm saying. But not that Tiger Woods did. I don't think that's the case necessarily. I don't know, but he's look. He's always been a jacked golfer, and which was always surprising to me. He was the first one. Serena Williams was always a jacked tennis player, and she was the first one. There's, there was rumors about her for years and years and years. But when I saw him, not only did he look great, um, but uh, he was he was a little little thinner. Um, but he was crushing it like it was like yeah. I th- it, I think him and Phil had a side bet as well. That's what it <laughs> I'm felt sure like. Sure, there was some action. But you're right, Tiger looked lean. He was sending a message like, if the tour would let me wear shorts, I would destroy all these guys every week. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking you're of right, uh, Tom Brady uh, did not look great, and I'll be honest with you, I might be in the minority of New England Patriots fans here, but like I'm not rooting for them to have any modicum of success down there. Uh, whatsoever. Like, I'll get Bill Belichick's signature tattooed on my body. I hope the Bucks go three and fucking 
a lot. And <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm amazed seeing Patriots fans like buy Tampa Bay gear, you know? Yeah, it's Fucking strange. No, they're young. I think it's because they're young. I think it's because they're young, right? Because any Patriots fan who grew up in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, you put in the time, you're with the franchise. You're not with the franchise quarterback. You're with the franchise. Agreed. Agreed. And I'm the same way with my team. Like, <clears throat> if the the favorite, you know, the favorite player leaves, it's not gonna. I'm not gonna root for him on some other fucking team. Uh, you know, I'll be sad about it, but nothing I can do. Uh, yeah. Team comes first. No, fuck him. Uh, so before <laughs> before we get on to the uh, the the next card, I want to go back yeah. to the Gaethje Ferguson fight because I've never seen a fighter as skilled as Ferguson get dismantled so thoroughly for every single round. Like there was a 10 second window there, and we talked about this earlier. How Gaethje has a tendency to f- lose focus sometimes, especially when he's ahead. And I think that's common for a lot of athletes. Didn't really happen that much this time, but there was a 10-second period where he got popped once where he was clearly – he had his hands down and blah, blah, blah. But for the most part, he fucking took Ferguson apart. That's story one. Story two is I've never seen someone stay on their feet after getting the shit kicked out of him that badly before, ever, in any fight. Justin Gaethje is such a savage that – on Instagram, the one photo he put up from this fight was that uppercut that you referenced yeah. that hit him, right? I mean, you set it up well in terms of Tony on the feed, and I think that's sort of the lead, right, is the damage that Tony sustained. Because anybody who has covered boxing will tell you that's how boxers die, right? They mm-hmm. get yep. perpetual damage to the head. They're too tough for their own good. They don't get knocked down. Obviously, if Tony had gotten knocked down repeatedly, Justin maybe could have gone in and tried to get him out of there earlier. But Tony just in total Terminator mode, totally too tough for his own good, very scary to watch live. And yet you still felt like somehow he was in that fight despite absorbing an inexorbitant number of significant strikes, all of them to the head. I was pleasantly surprised to see him dancing in his hospital room the next day. Uh, but yeah, Gaethje fought the near perfect fight. You're absolutely right against the guy in Ferguson who's probably the toughest matchup for most guys in that division. Yeah. So don't have enough good things to say about Justin Gaethje. My fantasy football team is called Team Gaethje. I mean, we've been ahead of the curve on this guy. Um, but yeah, it's crazy for Tony, man, for his legacy uh, to be on the wrong end of this type of beating. You know, um, it's it's tough to see, but I'm happy for Gaethje, sad for Tony, and uh, <clears throat> it's going to put Tony out for much of the year, I would think. But we'll I, see. I honestly think he should take a full year off after getting his head banged around like I that. I agree. Uh, yeah. on, back to Gaethje, though. Uh, I mean, there's only one fight that I can see happening for him now and that's Khabib right at this point like he's I feel like he's done everything possible to earn a fight against the title holder right now so I'm wondering how you think he matches up against someone like because look if it's another one of those fanless fights and Gaethje has his corner talking to him and keeping him focused the whole time I think that matches him up pretty well with Khabib but Khabib on the ground is maybe the best in that weight class we've ever seen so it's a different it's a it's a it's not like two sluggers. It's not like two wrestlers. It's a it's a weird combination. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. It's an incredible stylistic matchup. And certainly for Justin Gaethje, he is now the interim lightweight champion. So I know maybe Conor McGregor would like to fight Gaethje right now. But he has the interim belt. And he has an undisputed champion in Khabib Nurmagomedov mm. who has the same manager. And you guys know Khabib only wants to fight the most deserving guy. Yeah. And now there's an interim champion. So I think the fight is going to happen. It's fascinating stylistically. I mean, I think Gaethje obviously poses a lot of problems on the feet. Every round begins on the feet. But I think it's going to take another near-perfect fight. Mm. And most guys who fight Khabib, Dustin Poirier Mm. recently, said you just don't know until you feel that guy what he's going to feel like. And it didn't Mm. go super well for Poirier in Abu Dhabi when he was really primed and thought he had a great chance to beat Khabib. And you know, just got him on the ground, just mangled him, suffocated him, and forced him to tap out. So Gaethje is a little bit undersized as a lightweight. He might dispute that, um, but he's not a guy that cuts a lot of weight. So if he is getting taken down, despite his collegiate wrestling credentials and his ability to get back up as a college wrestler, which really defined his college Mm. wrestling career, he don't want any part of that canvas. So Mm. fascinating stylistic matchup. I guess if I had to pick a lightweight right now on May 26, 2020 to beat the Khabib, it would be Gaethje, um, but Khabib should be the favorite for sure. I mean, he's a he's a bear. Well, who else is even, at least with regard to Khabib, the other uh, top-ranking guys, I mean, Ferguson was one of them. 
and he's not going to be fighting for a while. Connor's one of them, obviously, but Khabib's not going to fight. I don't think, unless I don't know what circumstances it would take for him to fight Connor right now without Connor re-demonstrating his ability to win in UFC again with a couple more fights against top tier talent. Uh, mm -hmm. Just because, like you said, there's something weird in Khabib's brain, and I think it's I don't think it's money or f or fame. It's something about this guy doesn't deserve to fight me. I think it's honestly that's what he believes, and say what you want about that, but that's more pure than saying, well, this guy's not going to make as much money because I think fighting Connor would make him the most money, but he's outright said he won't do it. So it's clearly not about that, right? Yes, and Nate Diaz is the same way. It's an honor and a privilege, in theory, to get to fight me because it's a big payday or whatever, and Nate Diaz only wants to give opportunities to guys that he thinks are tough and deserving. If they were to throw $30 million guaranteed for Khabib to fight Connor and let Connor skip the line, I don't think Khabib would take the fight. I really don't. He's, he wants to fight the interim <clears throat> champion. I kind of want to see Dana do that now just to see if he uh -huh. will actually – Fucking turn I'm telling it down. you, man, I'm, because because he has money and more money than he probably wanted or needed ever, you know. So I just I don't know. He's always approached his career that way, even the Ferguson fight, right? But now Connor does have a win in his back pocket. And say what you want about Donald Cerrone and the level of the opposition in January, and you guys were there. I mean, I just feel like the nature of that win for Connor, like it or not, a lot of people don't like it. It does inject him back into the conversation. But I think it's uh, it's a non-starter for Khabib, at least right now. I didn't appreciate the way everybody came after Connor after that last fight because indirectly they're coming after Cowboy Cerrone, and he's one of the best competitors in the history of the UFC. You can get if you if you think that uh, UFC just trotted him out there as some kind of fucking whipping boy. No, he wanted to win that fight, obviously, yeah. and he is plenty capable of winning that fight too. Like, he's, he's not some fucking pushover. This guy's one of the top knockout artists in the history of UFC. Oh, so. yeah. More wins, more finishes than anybody yeah. in UFC history. His current form was, you know, the betting line was reflective of Cerrone's yeah. current form. I think he had lost two straight going in, and now he's lost four straight on <laughs> four, paper. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, Cerrone was going in there to win. And, uh, again, he got his nose broken by a fucking shoulder strike 20 seconds into the fight. Yeah. Um, you know, that effectively changed the whole complexion of things, and it was over 20 seconds later. So, uh, As a fan, like me personally, I, I want to see Justin become the champion of the world. I, I hate Khabib's. I, I hate the his fighting style, all of it. He's boring as hell to me. Uh, I would love to see uh, Gagey beat Khabib and then Gagey fight McGregor. And I think that would be the ultimate mecca of like, and that's what I want to yeah. see. You know me. After all these well, years, and, you know yeah. me. Well, and I think that that's a realistic possibility, right? I mean, I think Gaethje absolutely can get it done. Then the question beckons, though, where is Tony Ferguson in all of this at that point in time? And does Khabib not have a rematch clause if yeah. he fights Gaethje? I mean, he's 28 No, You can't get a rematch clause. But again, when you have Conor McGregor lurking, maybe that is uh, preventative enough for them to not do a rematch clause. But, I mean... How would Khabib not get to fight this guy twice? In yeah, yeah. And, and look, since we're everybody's always talking about Conor McGregor, I found uh, Gagey's comments interesting about Conor McGregor where he said, look, man, the world wants to see Conor McGregor still, but he goes, inside us fighters, like we really don't give a shit, and he doesn't have that much power in today's UFC amongst the fighters. Um, I was really surprised to hear that because, look, he's still a monster payday, and if you fight McGregor, you're going to get paid no matter what. Um, Justin just seemed like he didn't give a shit. He was just like, mm. eh, I don't really care. I mean, you know, fighting yeah. wise, it is what it is. But I, I would, I want to fight the champion. I, I don't really care. He didn't. Conor he McGregor. didn't seem to care too much about that belt. No, either. Which was interesting to me. I, he was clearly making a point right there. Like, hey, I don't give two fucks about this interim shit. Let me fight this guy. Yeah. Which is a good yeah. attitude to have. That's what you want to see out of a fighter. Mm -hmm. You want to see that level of competitiveness. Chipper Jones used to call it necessary arrogance. But whatever you want to call it, that's very. It's it's a huge part, particularly in combat sports. It's a huge part yeah. of your attitude coming to the table. I just don't like. Look, if Gaethje fights Khabib, then there's obviously going to be a rematch clause. So it takes out some of the stuff that I was thinking before. But one, there's two things. One, that Ferguson fight that never happened. It's got to be weighing on Tony's brain right now. Like yeah. fuck, man, I could have been fighting, and anything had happened in a fight. I don't care. Like, Ferguson, you, we've seen the amount of damage that guy can take. I don't think he's an easy out for anybody. I don't care how – at that weight class, I don't give a shit how good you are. Khabib or Connor or whomever. 
it is. He can any fight he's in. Like, look how much damage he took during that fight, and how fucking close he came to knocking that motherfucker out with just a couple of fucking strokes. You know what I mean? Like, it, it was real close there for a second, and that can happen in fights anytime. So, but what I would like to see, Khabib's been out for a while now. I would like to see some kind of Grand Prix and some of these things. Like when there's an interim title or whatever the fuck, fuck that shit. Let's have a Grand Prix. Let's do, yeah. let's like you fight like two or three times over the course of three or four months, make it a whole presentation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it's a, it's a series. It's like the playoffs or something. You know what I mean? Cause that's one thing that I haven't seen in UFC yet that I'm kind of curious why we have it. Cause Grand Prix used to be a big thing in like K1 and shit like that back in the day. Maybe, yeah. maybe it's too brutal. Maybe maybe the, the camps are too brutal to do it that back to back like that. I don't know. It'd be fun. Yeah, I mean, we did a flyweight tournament back in 2012. It certainly wasn't competing on um, back to back nights or more than oh, no, once no. in a yeah. night. Uh, but certainly that defined uh, the careers of a lot of guys, you know, in the early 2000s. But uh, I think for Connor, had he fought Justin Gaethje in January and not Donald Cerrone, and all indications are that that opportunity would have been there, you know, then maybe things would be a little bit different in terms of the championship pecking order. But I yeah. think you got a lot of guys who are in a really good position. I think most people look at that top five as you got Poirier and Hooker, which uh, are going to fight, but um, – Lightweight's in a good place right now, and, and hopefully you see Khabib and Justin. You know, they're both motivated to make that fight. They have the same manager, as I mentioned. So I think, you know, August, September uh, unification bout, we'll see where it is, but I think it's going to happen. Is there any kind of rule against uh, UFC athletes? Uh, I, I don't want to use the word conspiring, but talking to each other and say, hey, neither one of us are going to accept this fight if it's not for X amount of money or something like that. Is there any rule against that? I'm, I'm just curious. I know there's no union for those guys. So – would that be considered price fixing or something? I don't really know how all that works in the sports world because most, almost every major sports uh, organization has players unions of some sort. This is obviously one of those right. that right. don't. So I'm curious. Well, I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if camps were talking like that and then trying to negotiate for a super fight. You yeah. know, the contracts aren't necessarily ironclad, right? There's mm -hmm. room to negotiate. I would think at times, even though I don't know all of the inner workings, I only say that because you see a guy like John Jones publicly mentioned that he's trying to negotiate for the Francis Ngannou fight right now when he has a signed long-term UFC contract, you know? Right. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a circle of MMA managers that have a lot of clients on this roster. So even though the UFC matchmakers and Dana White might be dealing with, you know, 50, 60, 80, hundreds of managers overall, there are five or six guys that have a pretty good stranglehold on this roster. So you can be sure that those guys are, are communicating and, uh, but I think the sport's in a pretty good place in terms of the management right now. I mm -hmm. think there are some bigger companies coming in that, that work in bigger sports that are looking at things in different ways. But, uh, yeah, the fighters, I don't know that you're going to see a union anytime. I mean, yeah, no. maybe not. I just, it, it concerns me when people leave for other organizations or when people like Cejudo retire because, and makes a point of saying not right. publicly, but behind the scenes makes a point of saying that it was because he didn't feel like he was getting, like he put in all this work, dominated two weight classes and still didn't get paid. That's at least how he feels. So that, that as, as someone who runs a media company, I understand that from having uh, employees who are content creators, and that's what fighters are for the most part, is content creators at this point in, in, right. in right. human history. So that really concerns me, and I don't want that to happen because I enjoy the UFC. I like Dana. I like you guys. Obviously, we're all friends and shit. I, I want to see yeah. it continue to grow and succeed because I think it's, it's, it's proven itself to be one of those sports, and we're all sports fans here, that can stand – not only the test of time, but when everything is fucked, we can still make this happen. We've proven it now. So whatever else happens, if we don't have baseball or basketball or football or hockey, we, can, we know we'll still have fighting, right? And I, it, it concerns me when the talent isn't happy. And I don't want to see like more of that continue down the line. I don't know what the solution is, honestly. I don't know what the numbers look like. I, I'm sure if you made everything public, usually what happens is the fighters – and, and owners have to meet somewhere in the middle or the athlete and the owner have to meet somewhere in the middle. That's typically the case, but uh, it's not like that yet. Yeah. Right. 
I have a lot of wishes in terms of fighter pay, like I think a lot of people do. I mean, certainly a revenue sharing model down the line maybe is something that could be worked out between the fighters and the promotion and mm-hmm. the TV networks and everybody else. Uh, there are plenty of fighters that are really well taken care of. There are a lot of discretionary yeah. bonuses that aren't reported. But for me, if I were to simplify it, right, wouldn't I love if all our champions would get a million bucks to show per fight, right? Yeah. At least a million bucks <laughs> to show. like become a UFC champion, like that would be great, right? But how much does Henry Cejudo sell? Just as one example, Mm -hmm. right? As an Olympic gold medalist and a simultaneous two division champion who defended both belts, you know, is Valentina Shevchenko worth a million dollars in show money every time she competes, if not more, you know? Like certainly these are the most world-class athletes in the world, but you're also talking about us being in a relative infancy when it comes to the sports overall history. So I wish I could look ahead and I'm hopeful that these guys will all be millionaires, but um, you know, it kind of is what it is right now. And, and flyweights haven't historically sold. I love you, Henry though. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things where it's entertainment at the end of the day. And if you're not selling, you're not the biggest star. You've got to either try to make yourself that or figure it out. Um, I don't think that one is all on Dana White either. No, it's not at all. But I think there's some stuff that he could do from his perspective, which is to uh, look. The, a fight camp is what it is. You need those people there. But you are. I, I think a lot of these dudes, and it's the same thing with a lot of military people as well. We are horrible self promoters. Uh, we can promote ourselves to the crowd, but promoting anything outside of ourselves, a product, for example, doesn't necessarily come naturally to us because we're like. I only promote, we, we personally only promote shit that we actually use. We do that for a reason because right. we don't want to sound like a bunch of fucking cunts, to be honest. Yeah. Right. Uh, but right. fighters, I don't think, especially these guys who get really successful. Other, There's a couple of them, like Connor's obviously a guy that learned how to build a brand and self-promote, but Khabib hasn't. Like he, he's, he's a brand in, insofar as his brand is basically like Marshawn Lynch. Like, he doesn't want to talk to the fucking media, right? Yeah. He's a quiet guy. Yeah. He doesn't care about all these fucking bells and whistles. He wants to fight. I get it, right? I get that. But yeah. if you're, like you said, if you're not making the organization money, you're not going to get paid. So I wonder if there's something more that the UFC could do to get them hooked up with PR people and all this stuff and from a very early age and start developing that brand because they've done that physically with the Performance Institute that, uh, that Forrest runs. Now, that's a perfect example of how you can provide something that you're really not obligated to provide, but it helps everybody and helps the sport. And it also helps the athlete more than anybody else. And I think that's your product, right? So I don't know. I don't know if that's really Dana's responsibility. People should be out looking to do that on on their own. It's tricky because even if you're talking about the 600th fighter on the roster, right? I'd love to see those guys make it even 50 grand to show, but Mm -hmm. there's no way that they're bringing that value back to the promotion. It's a really tricky thing. But in terms of building stars, I mean, and facilitating that, I mean, what they've done in China is incredible. Zhang Wei Li has just exploded as our first Chinese champion. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of layers to it. And I think you outline a lot of good ways to do it, but it's an imperfect system. And, uh, you know, Daniel Cormier is certainly a guy who has maximized his mm. utility in the spotlight and, and will do very well beyond his fighting days. But, uh, yeah, it's a tough thing. I mean, you hate to see Cejudo walk away in his prime. Um, you know, I think he did everything in his power promotionally on social media, mm-hmm. um, you know, cringeworthy or not, to try to sort of resonate with people, make people have an opinion. And uh, I'm not sure what the internal metrics say, but uh, he wasn't making a million bucks to show, and I think he would have liked to have been. Yeah, I think uh, honestly, from from like, there's a huge part of me that thinks that Connor is a decent, normal human being that isn't the asshole that he portrays, and that is a heel character like from the fucking WWE or something that he does in public a lot. Like when he was on the Ultimate Fighter, for example, he was a piece of shit to everybody on that show the whole time. Uh, like there was some stuff he imparted that was cool and stuff. But that whole situation with uh, right. Uriah Faber and just try, trying to right. emasculate him in front of all the other f- young fighters, like, come yeah. on, man, what, what are you even doing here? But honestly, people need villains as much as they need heroes. Like when we, even at the macro level, when we're going to war with somebody, we don't talk nicely about who we're going to war with. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like we, we, right. den- we denigrate them. We talk about why we're right and they're wrong and all this other bullshit. You need that. I think you need that in competition sure. to motivate you or – to focus you or whatever it is that kicks that adrenaline in that gives you tunnel vision on accomplishing your goal. 
Um, I just don't know if, uh, if people see it that way. Cause a lot of people dislike Connor because of that, but I, it's like, would, do you dislike fucking Brad Pitt? Cause he played an assassin in a, in a fucking movie. Like it's, well, it's really tricky. You're, you're right with Connor. It's like, because he's larger than life, people just no longer, and this is a generalization, but it's a majority that just doesn't seem to respect him as an elite fighter and striker. Yeah. And because he only has one lightweight win, the weight class, 155 pounds that everybody thought he would be best at in the UFC. He's only won one fight there. Of course, it was the championship against Eddie Alvarez, mm -hmm. but it has become less about mixed martial arts legacy and more about A-list celebrity, not necessarily in terms of him, but in terms of the public perception. So when he goes on this goat tirade over the weekend and talks about maybe retiring as the greatest of all time, it's because, as many of us who know him have been saying for years, he cares deeply about his mixed martial arts legacy. Mm -hmm. You don't think he'd like to see more scalps on there? You don't think he'd like to see Gaethje's name or Ferguson's name on his resume? He does care. But it's not as easy for him to just show up without a crowd. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm sure he'd love to be competing this weekend, but it's not necessarily all in his hands anymore. Yeah. And by the way, if you're looking at uh, like self-promotion as a whole and the best way to do it, there was a doc on Deion Sanders um, when he was talking about his time at Florida State. And he was already dreaming about getting paid in the NFL, but he knew that as a cornerback, it wasn't a sexy position. Nobody cared. And so he had to create a persona and he did it in college. And he goes, dude, I followed this formula. This would make me the most money. This would make me the most famous. And it, it worked. All of it worked. That I'm, I'm not yeah. saying anybody that can do it because it's hard to be that famous and be good at being famous is also another skill. Um, <clears> but <throat> it will certainly get you paid. And if Henry Cejudo, for example, uh, was had the biggest personality in the world and was slapping people around at press conferences, throwing water and, and tr you know carts through buses and shit. More right. people would pay to see his fight, and he would make more money. Look, I right. I, I and, would say that uh, I I know that I'm, I'm sure I don't know I am sure that Dana doesn't want people to think that the UFC is the WWE. I got it. I, I know you want to have some credibility and respect to the fans for the technical and athletic skill of these dudes and, and women because they put in a ton of effort. You also don't want to delegitimize the sport. You also are dealing with gaming commissions and all this other shit. I got it. But there's a level of theater to this, and I think Dana's actually really good at it personally. He's great. He's really good at it. Yeah. And I just I want to see more of that dripping down to the athletes right. at this point. Like. And, and at, at minimum, 50% of that responsibility is on the athlete. Like, you have to understand where you are, what your marketability is, and then improve your position there. If you want that money, then you have to go do it. And look, if you're well, and, Henry Cejudo yeah. and, you, and you try to do it and it doesn't work, it didn't Sorry. work. Sorry, yeah. I don't know what to tell you, guy. Well, and it's hard because Khabib is the minority of a guy who – has done it organically. I mean, what's he at? 50, 60 million Instagram followers. Yeah. He's done it his way the whole time. And certainly there was the brawl with Connor that elevated his profile exponentially. Uh, and the win, I think, did as much, if not more, than the brawl, of course. But it's hard. A lot of these guys aren't able to stay true to themselves as respectful martial artists when they go into that social media mode. And these guys are so respectful to a man, to a woman, that it's like most of them are really stepping out of a comfort zone to call another fighter mm. out publicly on yeah. Twitter, even if the manager <laughs> begs them to do it. So it's a very tricky spot that a lot of these fighters find themselves in to try to do what it takes to sort of be relevant. Right. Um, I, you know, I can't tell you how many elite fighters we have competing like at UFC 250, you know, got 9,000 Instagram followers and they're literally the baddest people on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and to that point, I think there's a re there's a more subtle way of building that kind of legacy without, you know, coming off as a total dick, like Anderson Silva, for example, very, he come, his background in martial arts is one that demands respect. I don't mean his performance demands respect. I mean, the way he was brought up, there's no way that dude doesn't respect the skill and talent of other people and the work ethic of other people because that's how you're raised in that environment, right? Like for, as a young fighter all the way through your career. But still, is anybody better known for in-ring taunting than fucking Anderson Silva in the history of this sport? Right. Like right. moving his head around and fucking doing all this bullshit, which you see John Jones doing a lot more of, of late. I think that's a, a, out of the Anderson Silva playbook. But – this is a guy that, what did he won, 11 straight title defenses or some shit like that? 
over the course something of four crazy, years. Yeah. Something crazy. Uh, one of the better fighters in UFC history from a very disciplinarian background, but still he found a way to take his attitude and project it in a minor way. I think it's a minor way, but it still made him super marketable as a yeah, player. Yeah, and his style, his yeah. style of fighting certainly resonated with fans. Yeah. He also competed at 185 pounds and not 125 pounds. Yeah. I would ask you guys, like, what the fuck else could Henry Cejudo have done, right? And humbly, I would say promotionally, I feel like we did a pretty good job mm -hmm. trying to – yeah you know humanize him in terms of his childhood and and all the things he didn't have um but as an olympic gold medalist who won belts who tried to develop a secondary perso persona as the king of cringe and triple c like i would ask you guys what else could he have done other than be you know bigger than you guys you know i just feel like the size really worked against henry and and that's why he didn't do bigger pay-per-view numbers because he put everybody away uh he worked on the outside the octagon stuff and yet he's walking away at the height of his career yeah so my answer to that is is uh, there's only one thing that i'm left with with him and it's simply yeah. to have moved up in weight classes um that's it uh, or because, murder somebody. Yeah, or murder somebody. You, know, you, you could have OJ'd it, or Ray Lewis. To, yeah. You know, Ray Lewis came back um, and ended up winning another title. But well, he didn't actually. So move anybody. up again well. and chase the third, because that was his plan. Russ, was to be yep. to go up to featherweight and become C four. Yep. But I think he just thought it was it was biting off more than he. It's just too big. He's too big. You know, but those guys I, are too big. Well, that, you know, that's he, probably he, that. To me, that's it. That was the yeah. only thing that he he possibly could have done. Yeah. Other than that. There's nothing you can do about your size. There's nothing you can do about that weight class. Because, look, that weight class in boxing isn't sexy either. And those guys, for years and years and years, those flyweights, they never got paid um, in, in real boxing. So, yeah, I, it's tough, man. Sometimes you're just born the way you are, and you can do the most with it as you can. And I think he <laughs> maximized well, it. Well, yeah. he, he's about the same size as uh, Jose Altuve. Maybe he should have played baseball. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I oh, it's tough. Because that guy's well, making plenty of money. And the thing, too, I'll be honest with you guys. So when I got my first UFC fight card assignment, January 20th, 2012, Nashville, Tennessee, at where I was in my life as a mixed martial arts fan, the first thing I did when I got that fight card was to see how many fights were happening at 185 pounds or above. Because uh -huh. I like to see the big guys beat the shit out of each other. You know, <clears throat> I've evolved and now I love 135, 145 pounds. But when I first got into this thing, I wanted it to be all heavyweights on the damn card. I think know? that's Same. I think that's uh, because you're a fucking Patriots fan and you're used to seeing the most boring fucking style of play of all time <laughs> oh, the one yeah. year they had an exciting team they went 16 and 0 and then lost in the goddamn Randy playoffs. Moss, yeah and then you lost oh, i'm it. telling you that's why i'm excited for this season because the regular season you're gonna have coin flips so you're gonna be able to get the pats minus one i took the over yeah. i took the over at eight and a half wins yeah so eight and a half uh, was the pats this year yeah. i hammered the under on that um i mean who's playing quarterback Who's playing quarterback? I don't Stidham. care. Stidham, I guess, I don't, is your, I don't is your care. guy. We have uh, Fred Smoot on the show next week, who, by the way, oh, nice. most entertaining motherfucker on the planet. Yeah, of, you guys got to have him on your show for God, sure. For anything. You can have him on for anything. You can have it at a barbecue, and that guy's hilarious. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, I asked him the same way. Him and Dan both took the over at eight and a half because it's already out on my bookie right now. <clears throat> well, they, uh, eight and a half wins is, Smoot is made the New the England good point. total. Yeah, I, he made the point that the the Patriots sucked on offense last year, and they were primarily a defensive team. So right. the question is, did did Brady play? How far above replacement level did Brady play? I would say not very far, to be honest. Yeah. Plus, he didn't have any weapons, just like they don't have this year. So, I mean, I, I don't see it as that big of a difference. You got the over. Eight and a half. Well, they've had a lot of defensive deflections that nobody's talking about, right? Defensive players that have gone on to Miami or other places. Yeah. So I'm not sure the defense is going to be as good. Mm -hmm. All I'll tell you is that Brian Hoyer is the worst backup quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> there are 64 quarterbacks on these rosters on game day, active on game day. He's 64. Yeah. So I guess if it's Jarrett Stidham, but no, I'm going under. Uh, in Belichick, we trust, but I just don't know who's playing quarterback. There it is. I got that under as well. Speaking of which, uh, we'll get to uh, this weekend's cards as well, brought to you by mybookie.com. Promo code Drinking Bros doubles your deposits. I'm trying to look up Brian Hoyer's we'll salaries see, right uh, now. Brian Hoyer's salary is Good. disgusting. It'll make you kill yourself. It's so <laughs> it's so amazing. Uh, we'll start with the ladies first. Uh, Mackenzie Dern and Hannah Cyphers. Strawweight. 
Yeah, so uh, Mackenzie Dern, second fight since having her first child last June. Oftentimes when we talk about Mackenzie Dern, de decorated world-class Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but we talk about the weight cut. She appears to be in a pretty good place, getting a lot of respect from Vegas. Cyphers is super tough, um, but Mackenzie Dern obviously deserves all the respect that she's getting from uh, the odds makers. What do you boys think? I think I, I'm very curious whenever when female athletes come up because that's a huge deal. Your hormone levels change drastically after having a child, mm -hmm. particularly your second child. Serena right? still hasn't won a, a major. No, and I feel I, – I wonder if, like, there isn't some I, – I know that, that professional sports has a very complicated history with regard to performance-enhancing drugs. I got it, man. I understand. But if – if somebody has all the other physical talents to do something, they just happen to have low testosterone because of some physical ailment or so, of some sort. That's the that's the one thing you can't correct. Like you can't bring that back up to a nor like a 28 year old woman, right. for example, right. shouldn't have a testosterone level of like 25. It should be like 125. Right. And if it's not at those minimum level levels for an athlete of that age, I feel like you should be able to correct that. Yeah. Right. Why not? Like if you if, if you're born with naturally high testosterone. You're gonna have more muscle mass. You're gonna be your quick twitch will be faster. Your fucking eyesight's better. All that stuff is better. So yeah. that's like, I mean, if you had asthma, you could take a steroid, a prednisone inhaler. So what's the, I don't I don't get it, man. I think she should let the baby fight as well. Yeah, let the babies fight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like let the baby in the ring if she's getting beat, uh, and only at a certain yeah. point. Obviously, I think the announcers and uh, and maybe Herb Herb Dean should. Uh, decide when the baby can enter the ring. Um, I am all in on Mackenzie Dern on this, though. All right, you like Mackenzie Dern? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, Cyphers is tough, but uh, she's got a very tough matchup, a little bit undersized for the weight class, so we'll see. Yeah, and I mean, uh, <laughs> my bookie's not very kind on these odds. It's minus 390 for Mackenzie Dern, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, she, uh, again, when she came into the UFC and she she just suffered her first career loss to Amanda Hebos, who's now a contender. But when Mackenzie Dern came into the UFC, most people envisioned her as a future top contender. And Cyphers has sort of overachieved. So, uh, you know, it's Mackenzie Dern's fight to lose. But you guys know this is the land of the unpredictable. So, yeah, sort of. I mean, it's me. Um, I don't really miss that much. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Mackenzie Dern in this one. <clears throat> Kids at home, you can put your American dollars on I'm a, that. I'm, I'm a fan of hers. I'm a fan of that yeah. baby. Uh, next up, we got uh, <laughs> Roosevelt Roberts against Brock Weaver. Um, now, Brock Weaver, for those of you who are playing along at home, doesn't have a C in his last name. Um, how much do you think that plays into it? Yeah, Brock Weaver, B R O K. His parents Strange. were not a fan of that silent C there, Ross. You know, <laughs> uh, but as a John with no H, we kind of like the Brock no C. What the fuck you need that C for? <laughs> yeah, but a John with no H is an abbreviation of Jonathan, right? That's not that uncommon. No, nobody has nobody is named Brock with one C. Imagine Scott with one T. That irritate. I want to punch people like that in the face. Matt <laughs> Matt Best has got one T in his name. I know name. they yeah. fucked up. Second one they took out. I'm with you, John. I think you take that H out, and simply because you don't know how dumb your child is going to be. Uh, I named, you know. I named my my first son Jax. J A X. That's it. It's not short for anything. Just in case yeah. he, he turns out to be a little dummy, he can always spell his name. It's three letters. <laughs> I like that, and I like this fight. It's a couple guys who came off of Dana White's Contender Series. Both have a lot of momentum. Roosevelt Roberts has one career loss uh, and he learned a lot in 15 hard minutes with Vince Pichel came back and won a fight since certainly I think most people think Roberts has the higher ceiling but Weaver's a tough kid man it's a good fight um, but I think Roberts deserves to be in that prohibitive favorite territory that you're seeing him at well two two of uh, Weaver's last three fights have ended and him being disqualified right no, he's actually won like seven or eight in a row. He actually won his UFC. Oh no, he he his opponent was disqualified. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. what I meant. Sorry. So he took like a knee to the head when he was on the ground or some shit in the last one, right? Right, and that was his UFC debut. That's um, weird that so. it would happen twice in his last three fights. Like t two of the last three fights he's won, which are two of his last three fights, he's been the opponent has been disqualified. That seems kind of rare. I mean, it's not very common that people get DQ no, from fights these days, no, unless it's. Unless it's like a homeboy from the NFL that doesn't know the rules and shit. Um, oh, he always been banging on Greg Hardy. Everybody yeah. likes to bang on Greg Hardy. Yeah, I, I, well, he, he, I mean, he likes to bang on women, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know. That shit right up there, didn't I? Um, <laughs> really teed that one up, John. We knew that was coming. 
but no, I, I just think that guy can just do no right in the court of public opinion, uh, no matter what he does. But yes, obviously getting DQ'd in Greg Hardy's UFC debut, Dan, did not help uh, mm. the cause. That was not the 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 jumping off point that he was lo- looking for. No, because no. we, we were there at that fight. I don't know if you were at any of those or not, but the contender series where he fought that other, I think it was a guy from Tampa Bay, a defensive lineman from Tampa Bay. Austin he, Lane. Austin Lane, yeah. He hit that guy so hard. That I was Dude. like, is someone dead? I didn't know. Because, you know, the Contender Series, the way it's set up, it's like maybe 50, 70 people in there. And probably 20% of that are the families of the two fighters. Or, or the oh, fa- yeah, yeah, families yeah. of yeah. the fighters yeah. uh, uh, that are going on right now. And um, that guy got hit. And I was like, oh, shit. These people are going to have to watch their fucking loved one get carried out of here. Because he hit yeah. him so goddamn hard. But, he, I mean, he popped up after. He got. I mean, he got hit hard twice. He got knocked down once and then knocked out, and he got back up and walked out. I'm like, all right, cool, that's fine. I I would die. I think if I get hit that hard, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. but it's like Chumbawamba says: you get knocked down, you get up again. You know, and I think it's a life lesson that we all should carry. <laughs> I'm gonna take Roosevelt Roberts in this fight. Okay. Um, uh, and I'm, I feel pretty firm about that, D'Anthony. About yourself. Um, man, I don't know. I feel like uh, you have to pay attention when somebody's getting lucky when somebody's on a streak Mm -hmm. like that. And I think two of your last three opponents getting DQ'd, that qualifies to me as luck. I'm going to go with Brock with one. Oh, one K. Just one K. No C. All right. Uh, Next up, we got Kevin Holland against Daniel Rodriguez. Hey, let me stop you right there. Kevin Holland is injured and out of the fight. Is he really? On drinking bros. So uh, he competed 10 days ago at middleweight. He was going to make a quick turn here at welterweight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Word came down, I think, earlier today uh, that Kevin Holland, due to his shoulder, is out of UFC fight night on May 3rd. Are, are they going to replace him? Uh, is Daniel Rodriguez They're still going to fight? They're gotcha. trying to, um, but no word yet if they've been able to find somebody. Obviously, it's a tricky, uh, trickier navigation than normal <laughs> trying to find a last-minute replacement. Well, I bet uh, Masvidal would fight him. Fuck Seattle. <laughs> I think that guy would fight. Yeah. Like if, if, if not he, that low on the card, If though. he had been – no, not that low on the card, but I, I feel like if he, if he was bored enough – and his grandma showed up and be like, hey, you want to fight or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I haven't beaten the shit out of anybody in a while. Yeah. <laughs> grandma. It'd be fun. Or that that's, uh, lady in New York in Central Park with the dog, I think she'd be down to fight. Isn't Masvidal oh, from uh, Miami? Uh, he's East Coast, right? Masvidal, I, I want to say. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's a 305 guy. Yeah, Miami, sure. Yeah, so he's, he's out there. Tell, call him up. Yeah, get him on the horn. Get him on the horn. <laughs> that's, my, that's my guy right there. It is. I, look, we love watching him fight. When is he coming back? Probably fighting Kamar Usman for the undisputed welterweight title. Yeah. But, uh, you know, this yeah. COVID-19 thing is getting in the way of a lot of shit if, if you haven't heard. I know. I, I know. But it feels like the UFC is above it. Like, let's get let's get it on, you know? Let's well, look, um, I want to see it. So I want to see that fight. For sure, and I don't give a fuck. But about I feel COVID-19. like it would already be announced. It would already be announced. Same. Headline July eleventh, right now. You guys would be coming to International Fight Week. We'd be booking flights. Well, one hundred percent. But it's not. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, next up, uh, is it Blagoy? We go Blagoy with like a W sound. Blagoy even off. <laughs> is that okay, Ross? You got it. Why you is that? Boost, I mean, he's a big dude. I don't want to mispronounce his name. I do. So I, I don't had, want him showing up. I ask everybody this, by the way. I asked John Brinkus this last week. How much would you pay to, or would you would you pay to watch a documentary where Mike Tyson travels around the country and confronts people who have talked shit about him online? Yes. I'd like how yes. fucking great would that you be? Need my money now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, uh, you know. Like the end of Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, where they're flying around kicking the shit out of people the whole time. I want to uh, see Mike Tyson do that. I'll pay his legal fees. I don't yeah. give a shit. Yeah. Just make it happen. Yeah. But he's too high now. Yeah, it's too high. Yeah. He's going to fight Holyfield. No, so he's not. That's not going to happen. It'll be a charity. That's nice. Yeah, so so you're going uh, Blagoy on that, huh? Yeah, so we have uh, – I got the audio file of all 600-plus fighters on my phone saying their names. So Blagoy mm-hmm. Ivanov, great story, guys. Mm-hmm. So it was like 2012. Uh, he was stabbed in a bar and was on life support and eventually came out the other side, but he was in a medically induced coma. Fought off like Holy seven shit. guys. And this was four years after he beat the great Fedor Emelianenko in, at the Combat Sambo World Championships, you know, has come to the UFC, tough as nails. He's like up to my shoulders. Nobody can put him away. Uh, he's a slight underdog here against the Brazilian Augusto Sakai, who is 3-0 <laughs> on the UFC. Pick him fight according to Vegas. I would stay away, but 
but you guys obviously have to uh, to make a pick. We actually well, don't. And uh, luckily, we have a sponsor. <laughs> dead serious. Uh, luckily, we have a sponsor that I said, look, I, I don't feel comfortable telling the audience to bet on shit that I wouldn't bet on myself in real life because I'm not getting fucking paid to <clears throat> take money from strangers and other things, right? I'm getting paid for, for hopefully picking the winners and, and trying to. And I, I'm with you on this. I, I do not bet this fight, man. I stay away from shit like this. If you want to do it just to do it and you're bored at home and you want to flip a coin and throw some money on it, that's on you. Uh, and God God love it. I do the same thing too on some of this shit. Um, just because I'm fucking bored, I'll bet on Miami right. versus the Jets. Of course. Even though I don't want anything to do with any of that. But I'm bored, but I wouldn't tell you at home to go and bet on this shit. And, and I'm in the same camp. Uh, and, and so is D'Anthony on that one. I just, <clears throat> it's too hard to make money in this world. Like, I'm not going to try to... Take it from me by picking somebody that I have no fucking idea in this one. You can flip a coin yeah. in this. No, but I'm going with the Bulgarian here. Are you? Yeah. Oh, and he's, a sam- he's a Sambo guy, and uh-huh. he's tough as fuck. That's why. Okay. Because yeah. to me, that's yeah. like betting. I feel like any fight that Ferguson's in, I would probably bet on him just because I feel like he's so evenly matched with the current talent that the odds against him are not going to be good enough to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So even if he's an underdog, I usually bet on him. Just for that reason, because he can take so much fucking abuse yeah. that it only takes one or two little quick swats and he fucking knocks somebody out. Although this other dude, uh, Sakai, he's he's been knocking people out all over the fucking place lately. Like he's finished. Yeah. I think he has one decision in his last six fights and the rest he's finished. Something like that. Uh, yeah, he's, he's got a, a lot of power. And I'm sure yeah. you could find a sharp handicapper out there that would would make a case for Sakai. All I'm telling you is that to walk to the window and fade Wagoy Ivanov, given how tough he has proven to be. And he's been on the wrong end of a couple of decisions that could have gone his way. Mm. Uh, but he's just an exceedingly hard guy to put away and therefore for me bet against. But I guess maybe a slight lean to Sakai, at least in terms of uh, being the, the betting favorite. But it's too close to call for me. Same, and I'm gonna have to be on a bunch of lean uh, to bet this one. And I'm, you know, who knows what, what shape I'll be in Saturday night? But I, I'm, I'm staying away from this fight. By the way, Brian Hoyer's made about twenty million dollars in his career. Ooh, that hurts on the inside. <laughs> it hurts on the inside to hear shit like that. Terrible, horrible, Fucking terrible, <laughs> horrible. It doesn't hurt as much as knowing how much money uh, Alex Rodriguez made. Honestly. Oh yeah. Well, at least he hit what seven hundred and you know. I don't know. 50 home runs or whatever it is. I don't know. Uh, last but not least, we got uh, Tyron Woodley versus Gilbert Burns. So but- my bookie right now, it's Tyron Woodley minus 185. Gilbert Dorino Burns plus 160. Mm. I cannot wait to watch this main event. I think Gilbert Burns is a live underdog. It doesn't seem like a lot of people agree with that necessarily. He's won five in a row, world-class Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Uh, Tyron Woodley's got a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt in his back pocket. He also has the best takedown defense in UFC welterweight history and all the championship experience of defending the belt several times. Gilbert Burns has 11 UFC wins, but he's never main evented in the UFC, never mind taking out a former champion. So most people that I've talked to in the know believe that this fight is properly priced. And Woodley has been very good off extended layoffs in the past. But Gilbert Burns in this active cycle and in this prime form is not a guy that I would be looking to bet against. Uh, You know, I know both guys pretty well. I've been to Tyron's house in Ferguson, Missouri, and have a good personal relationship with him. Uh, On any given Saturday night, I think both of these guys could be the best welterweight in the world, and uh, it's closer to a pick em than the way it's priced for me, and just can't wait to sit down and, and put my feet up and watch it on Saturday. Yeah, you got to be super afraid of a guy that's essentially got nothing to lose, like Burns does at this point. I mean, he's <laughs> if for a fighter, you know, at this point in his career, you got to love being the underdog in this fight because, I mean, at least from a motivational standpoint, I'm sure that hypes him up pretty well because I'm sure he thinks he can win this fight. Otherwise, he doesn't belong in the fight. But there, I think they're a lot more evenly matched than plus one eight or minus one eighty five to you. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah. this is very close to a pick'em, to be honest. And whenever I see uh, a spread like this, to to me personally, I pick the underdog. Um, j- just because you know, look, when you have, especially in the UFC, you have a bunch of fights that you're betting on throughout the night. Uh, like we were saying before at the top of the show, you know, I went seven and one, and Dan went eight and zero mm-hmm. in that that last card. When you have that many fights that are great that you're going to bet on, I always lean towards the underdog in something like this. And I did with Gagey and won a shit ton of money off of that. Um, and I'm yeah. going to do the same with, with Gilbert Burns in this. 
Um, the fascinating one for me, and this is the over under round wise, is four and a half. So clearly, my bookie thinks this is going all five. What do you think about that? I would never, never want to be on over four and a half, given the way these guys hit, you know. Uh, the other thing that I think is important for betters to note, uh, if the reports are accurate, it's going to be the 25-foot octagon instead of the 30-footer. I cannot emphasize this enough to you guys and to, to betters out there. It's a different ball game. Uh, some people suggest maybe the advantage goes to the grapplers a little bit more because there's not a lot of room to get on your bicycle, so to speak. Our former matchmaker, Joe Silva, always wanted to only use the 25-footer because he felt like there would be more finishes, and I think statistically that uh, did sort of bear itself out. So there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide in a 25-foot octagon, and that's the one that's going to be employed at the UFC Apex. So uh, something that's worth paying attention to. Uh, I think we're probably going to get a finish. I'd say under four and a half. Uh, yeah. Know, yeah. I can I, see both guys putting the other guy away. I mean, the best odds for a finish are plus 200, and that's Tyron Woodley by KOTK or a disqualification. Yeah, I think that's the most likely uh, finishing method. But Gilbert Reno Burns has got a whole lot of power. And if we get into some situations on the ground, uh, as good as Woodley is down there, uh, Burns is next level. I think it's an interesting fight. Same. So I, I'm going to go with Burns, man. Uh, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take okay. it, my man. Take that. And I agree with a lot of your rationale in terms of having a few underdogs. And uh, when in doubt in MMA, if you're getting plus 160 and you think that the guy has a chance, why not fire? Yeah. You know? And the, and the other thing about it is, again, when you're betting eight, eight cards, right? And you're not just saving up for one, you know, it's not the Monday night game, right? Uh, you can, you can, shit, you can go six and three, you know, if you're betting nine. Um, and, and still come out ahead on the nights. I mean, shit, even if you're one over for the night on a, on a card like eight, you're going to be fine financially. Therefore, I, I'm, I'm going to lean toward my gut on this one and go with Gilbert Burns. And uh, yeah, whenever I see an over under a four and a half in a five round fight, I fucking hate it. Um, yeah, it's, it's brutal. Uh, so I, I never bet on the over on shit like that. Just as a fan, I don't want to see it. Which is also why I hate betting on unders and football and shit like that because it's just like, dude, I don't want to see a low scoring. Well, game. you can bet. So one of the props on my bookie is the fight goes the distance. For yes, it's plus one twenty. For no, it's minus one sixty. That's the bet I'm taking. Mm. I'm not going to take the over under on four and a half because the distance means five full rounds. Right. So even if it ends in that four or in that fifth round, mm -hmm. I still win if it ends before the fucking clock stops. So that's the bet I would take. That's bet. 3510 30510 on my bookie. You bet. That was my grandpa's uh, prison number two mm. uh, <laughs> up in Sing Sing. So I'm kidding. He was, he was never in prison. He was never, not that I know of. Uh, maybe he was. I don't know. Uh, John, it's always a fucking pleasure having you on the show. Uh, I'm going to miss you on the call on Saturday night. When's your next fight? So I'm doing June 6, June 20, June 27. So I'll be in Vegas for like 15 nights uh, in June. Um, but the next <laughs> one will be June 6, UFC 250. I'll be just laying low at the residence in quarantine by myself, boys. I'll miss you out there, of course. We will miss you as well. You're going to be in Vegas by yourself. I'm sure your wife is stoked about that for three weeks. And I think the casinos might open just in time. No, I'm going to be. Uh, <laughs> they are, actually. Guys, you know uh, that, we'll right? hitting the book. What's that? The casinos will be open by then. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I got a mask. Uh, I got gloves <laughs> to, to press those slot buttons. We'll be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it. Uh, hopefully you can win some money to uh, to thank your wife with, with some form of gift. Um, I'm telling you. Yeah, she's in for it. Right? Three kids, one adult. That's no good. Oof, mm. man. Florida's open, though, so you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> you're goddamn right it is. <laughs> For John Anik, D'Anthony D'Anthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros Sports Companion Show. Good night, everybody.